Family. It looks a little different for everyone. For some, it's mom and dad. For others, roommates who feel like family. And for others, it's your significant other, their golfing buddies, your children, a high school soccer team starting lineup, and oh look, they're all taking you up on the offer to stay for dinner, really testing the limits of that phrase, the more the merrier. But no matter where you call home, GEICO makes it easy to bundle and save on home and car insurance. Easier than making three frozen pizzas and assorted frozen veggies into a cohesive meal. Ladies, we want to meet you where you are. Welcome to Dare to Ask. Episode 2, the poop episode. Don't be ashamed, don't be afraid, we all poop. I'm Corey Jensen, your host for this Dare to Ask podcast. I'm a mom to a big family and have delivered five babies. And like many women, I try to stay informed about my wellness as well as the health of my kids. We've created a space to have open conversation about what's going on with the woman's body without feeling intimidated in a clinical setting. A place to talk like girlfriends do. A space that dares to ask. We're here to make a connection, be authentic, and really get to know your provider. Yes, know the person behind the stethoscope. Dare to Ask will be where you hear the questions that we are all curious to know, but just need a space to do it. You've landed on the Dare to Ask podcast, show hosted by Corey Jensen and sponsored by Essentia Health. Wait a second, I am a doctor. (laughs) My guest today is one of the brightest minds meets bright shining person personalities. She's a GI specialist at Essentia Health in Fargo. And so for a doctor, a wife, a mom of two little ones who says she thoroughly enjoys working with patients to help them through some tough stuff, she somehow manages to radiate a magnetism that frankly shocked me. Whatever preconceived notion I had, and maybe you have too, about what a poop doctor was like, well, They were put to rest after spending time with Dr. Kimberly Kolkhorst. I'm excited for you to get to know her a little bit. We get real about women and their GI issues, and I'm going to ask her why she says that diarrhea is an unspoken issue women suffer from. It's time to get personal. So, such an important question. I'm hard hitting immediately. If you had to pick between spending more money on shoes or a bag. The bag. (laughs) I'm 100% shoes now, and I used to always be the bag. Can I ask you something super personal then? If you're going bag, how old are you? 40. I'm 41. Ah! Okay, I've been bag my whole life (laughs) until 40, and now shoes are life. Because, I mean, of course I still want them to be cute, but comfort. Well, that's what I was going to say. That's why that instead of looking good, I want them to more feel good. Feel good. Okay, I got you. And I need more practical shoes these days. Yes. Because I'm on my feet all the time, but I want them to still look cute, too. Right. Yes. But but with the bags, that's where I can actually incorporate a little fashion. Yeah, I that's feel a little true. bit fancy, but it's also practical. It has to be the right size to fit everything, but not too big where you're digging around for too long. And <laughs> Have you fallen victim to the bag inside the bag inside the bag? I, you know, I've thought about it, but that's, <laughs> that's a little too much for me. <laughs> well, I'm all in on multiple bags. Stay away. <laughs> Save yourself. Don't go bag on bag on bag. Okay, so it. your title, your degree, all okay. of the things behind your doctor. Uh, Kimberly Kolkhorst and uh, DO, which is Doctor of Osteopathy. Ooh. And yeah. <laughs> I'm the chair of the GI department at Essentia Health. Nice. In Fargo. I love that. <laughs> you already give me such like women power. I adore the fact that you're willing to come on this podcast and we call it Dare to Ask. This particular episode, the whole episode is a dare to ask because we're going to get down and quite literally dirty. This will be our poop episode. That's right. And you clearly are very comfortable talking about poop. I live poop. Day in and day out, that is my life. I'm very fascinated how a woman who is 40, who is P.S. gorgeous, nobody can see this, but she's beautiful, you guys. How does one decide, I'm going to be a GI doctor and have poop be my life? Yeah, well, good question. So um, my father actually had liver disease, so mm. and he died when I was 16. And oh. so at that age, I just wanted to understand what was going on with him, and I wanted to understand the physiology and why he was having surgeries and what kind of procedures he was getting done. And his GI doctor was a female. I would always go to doctor's appointments with him, so I, I liked her and I looked mm-hmm. up to her. And so I think it kind of stemmed from there in terms of wanting to know more about liver disease. But then when I went to medical school, I you know you do rotations and everything, and I said I'm going to keep an open mind here, and I'm mm-hmm. you know and you do everything and every specialty. And then I always liked GI. 
The number one thing is GI doctors are happy people. It's a common thread I've noticed that GI docs are happy people. And then GI made the most sense to me. Dabbled in urology a little bit. I thought about cardiology, but I always came Hmm. back to GI. And I think the reason is because GI is not only clinical, so you have clinic work, and then you have hospital and inpatient stuff, but then you have the procedural side of things. Mm -hmm. And I I really like to do procedures. Mm -hmm. And so I can do, I do EGDs, colonoscopies, ERCPs, sigmoidoscopies, but then you also have the whole clinic side of things as well. So (laughs) it's it's a nice balance. I would be scared to see what your schedule actually looks like every day, (laughs) from what appointment to surgeries that you're bouncing in and out of. Yeah. Your specialty is, well, uh, I'm in awe. So I it's genuinely, not all poop. It's not all it's poop. It's not all poop, but, <laughs> but it, there is definitely a lot of poop. <laughs> poop is life. <laughs> so is there a specific organ that's your favorite? Well, I mean, I do love esophageal disorders. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a statement you don't hear every day. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of motility disorders, uh, difficulty swallowing strictures, mm-hmm. um, eosinophilic esophagitis that are interesting, and I I'm, I like to treat them. Um, where I did my training in Tampa, Florida, mm-hmm. I worked with an esophageal specialist, and he's known worldwide, Dr. Joel Richter. So I've got that as part of my training. And so I enjoy esophageal, but I do everything. I love doing ERCPs. That's where you go up in the bile ducts into the liver, and we remove Mm-hmm. stones. And my bread and butter is colonoscopy. I mean, that's <laughs> that's my bread and butter. So I obviously I love the colon. So I love everything about GI. I okay. really do. I love that you love. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta say, I don't have any personal experience here. I'm not sure is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or is it a thing that I'm going to have to be starting to take a little more seriously it's within right. the next decade or so? Exactly. In about nine like years that. for you. Yeah. So unless it becomes sooner in terms of screening. I think I'm going to have to take my foot out of my mouth because I'm sure there is something that you would be able to enlighten me about and most women about when we're talking poop we might have issues that we're not even really saying are an issue yet absolutely let's talk about frequency constipation or diarrhea every day isn't normal or how many times you're actually supposed to be going a day speak to the woman who's listening yeah i mean if we're talking poop specifically the three things that we want to really discuss are consistency Mm -hmm. so how consistent how formed or solid or mushy or liquidy are your stools then frequency so how often are you having a bowel movement Mm -hmm. typically how many times per day or if you're more constipated how many times per week or even how many times per month if it's that bad oh boy and then the duration how long have you been dealing with these symptoms is this more of a chronic issue or is it something acute because it does vary per patient Mm -hmm. however in general we do say if you're having more than three bowel movements a day or less than three bowel movements per week, that's where it's an abnormal frequency. If that's the case, what is your first step? Do you make an appointment with the GI doctor? First thing I would say is bring it up with your primary care doctor, family medicine, internal medicine, whoever your general practitioner is, and talk about it. And mm-hmm. that's number one, the first step. Okay. Don't hide your symptoms and like especially diarrhea. I mean, there's so many women that have chronic diarrhea and it gets to the point where they are afraid to leave their house because it is affecting their quality of life. And it's embarrassing and they don't want to talk about it. And so they just kind of live in denial and they just accept it as normal. And it's not normal. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, if we can work you up and find what the cause is and we treat this, you can have a normal quality of life. I'll get real ugly and personal here and say, (laughs) that's not my usual. I'm more on the opposite end of things. But my best friend, she talks about diarrhea and having it constantly. And I think that's just not normal. No, I mean, I have literally stood guard at work in the hallway so that she can run and use the bathroom. Oh my goodness. And of course, I know that this is a serious thing and we can laugh till we cry about it. It's not really that funny when it's a serious thing. Right, right. Yeah. So if she's having more than three bowel movements a day and if this has persisted for more than four weeks, then that is the definition of chronic diarrhea. Oof. So she definitely has to first Talk about it. Tell her primary care doctor Mm -hmm. because the primary care doctor might be able to start some workup and and then do a referral to GI. And then we would see her in clinic. We would talk to her, get more history, look at the medications, find out about family history, and then take it from there and then order more labs, other testing, um, maybe an EGD, a colonoscopy, that kind of thing. Gotcha. Yep. Now, if somebody's listening and they're thinking, okay, it's not that bad, but what if I have diarrhea two to three times a week? Is that normal? 
you know, that could be more like irritable bowel syndrome. So irritable bowel syndrome is still a chronic condition, but those patients tend to have more food sensitivities and their gut is just more sensitive. And so it's not just food, but it's also life. So Mm -hmm. your life and your stress, what's going on in your life has a direct effect on your gut. So if you're not sleeping well, if you're stressed out, if you're not exercising Mm -hmm. and you're eating poorly, those things all combined give you a very upset GI tract and can can result in diarrhea. And then you might have just fluctuate just a few times a week. And then with that, I typically tell people to A, make sure you take better care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then B, try to see if you can identify certain food triggers, right? greasy foods, fried fatty foods, dairy. Mm -hmm. Those are typically the top things that you want to try to eliminate, avoid, slash remove. Right. And then see if that would help cut back on the occasional diarrhea. These are all really great pieces of information that we need to be real about. Have this open conversation. I certainly remember in my 20s would not dare. Girls don't poop. Right. When right. you're in your 20s, girls don't poop. Nope. Like, they don't, they do. don't pass gas either. No, none of that. <laughs> none of that. Because we were all just unicorns. Everybody knows that. Just pretty unicorns <laughs> with unicorn poop <laughs> with, with the unicorn. rainbow sparkles yes, yes. <laughs> okay consistency you actually came in here with a poop chart yes please I did. tell me more because I am beyond fascinated well you know when it comes to consistency and you ask a patient to tell me what does your poop look like sometimes it's hard for people to describe it and so it's very nice because the GI society has actually came out with something called a Bristol stool chart And all of us GI providers, we always keep a copy of this in our little white coat pocket. And then we just pull it out and we show the patients and say, "Okay, here. Thank heavens. Yeah. Because, I mean, what do people normally say? They have no idea. It's like um, the little kid joke. Yes. What's brown and sticky? Right. Stick. How do you (laughs) describe poop? You need a chart. Yes. So it's great because it not only has pictures, but then it also has a nice description. And then we use that to help us determine the severity of constipation or diarrhea. Okay. With type 1 being the more severe constipation and then type 7 being the more severe diarrhea. Pull out this chart and we say, what do your stools actually look like? Okay. Point, point to one. Oh, so like type on. 1 is the separate hard lumps of stool. Or sometimes I say it's like, like rabbit pellet. Type Ooh. 2 is lumpy and sausage-like. So it's still a log, but it's kind of lumpy and hard. Okay. Type 3 is a sausage shape, but it has cracks on the surface. That's normal. Mm -hmm. Type four is nice and smooth, soft sausage or a snake. And that's a nice, normal stool. Like that's peak poop. Type three and four is peak poop. Okay. So you basically (laughs) want it sausage shaped and either having a little bit of cracks or more smooth. But as long as it's coming out nice and smooth and not too hard. Okay. So what you've just described, that's hashtag poop goals. Poop goals. <laughs> That's <laughs> Type 5 on the bristle chart is soft blobs with clear-cut edges. They might have a little form to them, but they're kind of like blobs, specifically differentiated between each type of poop. Now we're starting to say diarrhea. diarrhea. Okay. And then type 6 is mild to moderate diarrhea where the stool is more mushy and it has ragged edges. And I've had other patients kind of describe this as more like pudding-like consistency. But then it's not completely liquid. Okay, gotcha. And then type 7 is where it is. It's just completely liquid. There's no solid consistency to it at all. So that is your Bristol stool chart. All right. Yes. I, I feel empowered. Yes. We're, we're aiming at... Aiming for type three and four. We're t- three and four. That's, That's poop, poop goals. goals. Okay. Yes. Type three and four. And you can Google it and you can pull up a Bristol stool chart and you can actually see the pictures. And that way you can actually see what our poop goal is supposed to look like. Excellent. <laughs> That's what we're going for. Okay. So since we just covered those bases of what all of the different kind of stools are, let's talk a little bit more about diarrhea. You have said before that that is the unspoken spoken issue women suffer from. Right. If you have symptoms, talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then so even outside of diarrhea, when we're talking about GI health and what I do, my bread and butter is colon cancer screening. And so with colon cancer, that is a preventable cancer. Right now, our society guidelines say we have to start average risk screening for colonoscopies at the age of 50. So if you're not having symptoms, alarm symptoms, and if there's no family history of colon cancer, if you don't have inflammatory bowel disease, and you don't have a certain genetic disorders, then you're considered average risk. Mm-hmm. So right now, we start at the age of 50, or if you're African-American, you start at the age of 45. Okay. 
right now, there's a big push to try to lower that age to 45 for the general public right. because we are finding polyps and colon cancer in younger and younger patients. Do you support that? Absolutely, 100%. So the American Cancer Society supports mm-hmm. that. The insurance companies need to get on board with of course, this. And we yep. have to weigh the benefits versus the cost. That might be the wave of the future. Hopefully it is. Mm-hmm. But in terms of symptoms, and my pearl would be, if you have anything that you're concerned about with your GI tract, talk about it. Talk about it. And don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. We all poop. It's not something to be embarrassed of. I mean, that's kids and like, you know, they're potty training and I'm like, yes, awesome. Great job. You know, like we need to be encouraged to not be afraid to talk Mm -hmm. about our GI symptoms Mm -hmm. and to not be embarrassed. There is something about motherhood. If you were ever shy about poop, then just be a parent. Those walls start crumbling down. (laughs) I have four kids and my 13 year old son, Oh, he would just Fortunately, 13-year-old boys probably won't be listening to a woman's health uh, podcast, (laughs) but it was before he was two, and he was having a lot of GI issues, and we had to do the the poop sample stuff. You know, until you're taking scoops of your child's poop and putting it in a tube. (laughs) Oh, but it's so funny, too, how kids think poop is the funniest thing in the world. How many kids do you have? Two. Ages, names? Uh, Camden, four in February. Mm -hmm. And then Kennedy, she turned two in September. They're littles and a lot of work. Yes, Yes. they are. Four (laughs) and two. It's a very active and so many giggles. Glorious. Every time they pass gas, they laugh. Oh, Oh, who did that? (laughs) I mean, it's hysterical. It was a Zoom meeting with a teacher. She had a bunch of kids and she's like, okay, now take out your journeys book. And she, she passed gas. And then there's a pause, and then the kids go, what was that? And then one kid's like, she farted. And then they all, everybody's like, ah! <laughs> Died they laughing. Died laughing. And the teacher was so embarrassed, and then she started laughing, and it's... Because it's funny. Right. You guys, it's funny. Yeah. So my littles are five and seven. One of them had put whoopee cushion on their Christmas list, and they didn't get it. Oh. And both of them were talking about, next year, we both better get whoopee cushion. <laughs> Passing gas and poop is funny, but they're making sure Santa gets it to her. Oh. <laughs> Whether you want to be real comfortable with poop or not, you're going to be when you, when you have Absolutely. kids. Absolutely. As far as daring to ask. Along that topic would be fecal incontinence. Okay, fecal so, incontinence. Yes, yeah, so having an accident. Uh-huh. And you're an adult. Right. We just transitioned from talking about kids, but fecal incontinence mm-hmm. yes. as an adult. That's correct. I just poop my pants. That's right. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm an adult. <laughs> right. That's a thing, though. That's not just an accident. No. Especially if accident continues to happen. That's correct. Those patients are very embarrassed. Of they course. don't want to talk about it, but then it happens again. Oh. And then it happens again. And then it's you're finally, wa- and then you have to wear a diaper because you're afraid of when is yes. it going to happen again. And then. I don't have a change of clothes with me or if I'm in a public place. Mm -hmm. And that's hence back to what I said from the beginning where these patients, they don't want to leave their house. Or what they'll tell me is if they leave, they always have to immediately identify the first bathroom and know where it is right away so they can get to it. So that the other fancy medical term is fecal urgency. So the urgency, when I got to go, I got to go right away. And if I don't make it, then I'm not going to make it. And then I'm going to have an accident. And that is something we need to be able to talk about as well. Absolutely. Dealing with either of those, the urgency or the incontinence. Mm -hmm. You're Mm -hmm. dealing with a patient for the first time. Mm -hmm. They are they're finding out that there's a term here. It's not I just poop my pants. Fecal incontinence. That's right. What do you do? What is there to treat that? So typically people with fecal incontinence also have diarrhea. Mm -hmm. So. First would be the workup for diarrhea to figure out what could be causing the diarrhea. If they don't have diarrhea and they just have these episodes where they can't hold it in, then that gives you a clue that it might be more the anal sphincter, which is the muscle that actually helps you to hold stool in. Right. And so with that muscle, it can get damaged. Different things that can cause damage to that muscle. Number one, just being a woman and having vaginal deliveries yep. and having babies, having an episiotomy. I asked, mm-hmm. did they have to cut you to get the baby out? Because they can tear the anal oh. sphincter. Did you require sutures? You had to require sutures, then you might have had some damage to your anal sphincter. So, or even just a big baby coming out will tear. I know. I've had monsters. Those big heads. I know. Yes. <laughs> Another cause, if you've ever had any low back Uh, injuries or Mm -hmm. low back surgeries because the nerves that come right out of that sacral area can innervate that anal sphincter muscle and it could be more of a neurological issue. Oh wow. Yeah. So this all sounds 
kind of scary. Is that a muscle that can be repaired? There is hope. There is hope. There is hope. So the first thing would be to rule out all the other things that can cause a chronic diarrhea. So Mm -hmm. if there's microscopic colitis, which is, um, it comes in two forms, or if there's inflammatory bowel disease, which is ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, or if the patient has celiac disease, Mm -hmm. or if they have a bile acid induced diarrhea after having their gallbladder removed, or there's all different things that can cause diarrhea. So first would be the workup for those things. And then if they have, for instance, microscopic colitis, This is a condition that will give you severe diarrhea and fecal incontinence because the diarrhea is so bad. The number one cause for microscopic colitis is actually shown to be NSAID use. So ibuprofen, Mm -hmm. Aleve, Excedrin. I had a patient, she was a tennis player. (laughs) She plays tennis and she's getting a little older. So she found if she takes an Aleve every day, her muscles feel great. She does well. And all of a sudden she develops diarrhea with fecal incontinence. She went to the movie theater and she was with a girlfriend and she had an episode and was in the bathroom stall. The girlfriend had to leave and come back and give her a change of clothes. And this was unusual for her, you know, so sure enough, she went in, had a colonoscopy, had the diagnosis of microscopic colitis. She stopped the NSAID use, got specific steroid that you okay. take for a short time okay. just to help decrease all the inflammation. And then boom, diarrhea gone, fecal incontinence gone. That's a happy ending right there. Yes. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So when you say there is hope, there is hope. There is for hope. a lot of these conditions a lot that of are brought things. onto this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then even if it's the anal sphincter, if it's an issue with the sphincter muscle, mm-hmm. we have different treatments for that. First of all, we start with antidiarrheals or bulking agents. So like sure. Imodium and fiber to help bulk up the stools. Yep. Then if that's not enough, then we can um, refer them for biofeedback. There's actually physical therapy where they put electrodes on the sphincter oh, wow. muscle and have you retrain your brain to tighten that sphincter muscle. So the f- physical therapy has been shown to be very helpful. Wow. And then we also have another technique called, it's a sacral nerve stimulator, where they can put these electrodes um, into the sacrum, and there's a little battery that gets implanted into the buttock. And then you have a little cordless device that you can turn these electrodes up and down. And then you use that to stimulate the nerves that then stimulate the muscle to tighten. And then that helps to cut back on fecal incontinence. So there are options. So again, you're blowing my mind today because (laughs) brand new information to me. I think it goes back to because nobody talks about poop. Right. Let me get this checked out and let me get this fixed. I don't Mm. have to live this way. Yeah. You know, and I think that's so important. It is. And I want people to know that, like, don't feel embarrassed, come out. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, too, it's so important to find providers that you feel comfortable with. Yes. There's a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA, somebody you've gone to before and you just didn't feel comfortable and you couldn't share it, then, then go to someone else. Mm-hmm. Medicine, in my opinion, is a partnership. And so we have to work together. If we're going to get you better, you have to be honest with me. I have to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. You've got to quit smoking if we know that that's what's causing this. You know, right. we have to work together and we have to be honest, too. Yep. And you have to be able to come out and say everything that's going on. And if you don't feel comfortable, find someone else. Mm-hmm. If there's women, if you feel more comfortable talking to women, there's plenty of female providers and find a female provider. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such solid advice. But I want to then point the finger back to Essentia. I've had such great experience with primaries to my midwife to OB. It just it's because of connection. Right. Provider that's really listening to you and you feel heard. And there's the honesty. Right. We're in the trust tree. You know, it is a partnership. And I'm so glad to hear you say that because that's I have a lot of pride and integrity in what I do. Mm -hmm. I, I love the people of Fargo and I feel like all of the patients at Essentia really do appreciate and they they get it. They Mm -hmm. see that. Mm -hmm. They know that there's great providers. We take time to talk to you on an individualized basis and just treat you as a human being, not just, okay, you know, the 40-year-old female with blonde hair and diarrhea. You know, I mean, we get to know you. You're not, yeah. (laughs) Exactly. I I have patients all the time that when they're done with their colonoscopy, they're like, you know what? Thank you. This was so much better than I thought it was going to be. People even come in like, who would have thought that I would have actually enjoyed my colonoscopy? I have actually heard both of my parents saying it's not as bad as people say it is. Oh, no, it's not. It's not. It's thinking about it, working yourself up about it. Maybe the thought of having a tube in your butt is what freaks people out. But you know what? It's 
it's so worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of for colon cancer, it's worth it. Colon cancer is preventable. If you're living with bad symptoms that can be fixed, it's completely worth it. Our staff at Essentia, we treat everybody like family. Mm -hmm. And the best thing is we feed patients toast and we give them a drink afterwards. (laughs) So, and I tell them all, I'm like, we have gourmet toast. Yeah. So, and when I was (laughs) pregnant, I've I've gone through two pregnancies at Essentia. And so every time I'm done and I walk into the post-operative bay, it always smells like toast in there. <laughs> After you've done a full prep and you haven't mm-hmm. eaten, and mm-hmm. we, we do toast, we do peanut butter, butter, jam, I love it. give you some coffee, and people are like, yes. It's because thank carbs. You. I mean, people love carbs. I know. We love them. And it's really not that bad. The prep is mm-hmm. the worst part. Mm-hmm. Be in yeah. a blink of an eye, it'll be over, and exactly. it won't be that bad. And you'll be like, oh, wow. I have to say goodbye to you now? Right. No. It's all over? <laughs> People, when you take away their food. I have <laughs> sworn that I was the inventor of hanger. <laughs> like, as soon as we're told we can't have something, that's, that's when we when want it the want most. It. Absolutely. <laughs> we get just so angry about it. Especially when my patients have told me when they're doing the prep, they don't realize how many commercials there are for food. Right. <laughs> and they're like, stop showing me hamburgers or French. <laughs> fries and it's like all I want is a burger you know exactly well you had said something interesting at the beginning of this podcast episode about GI doctors are happy yes so what is your happy and why do you think that is you're radiating it if you had a color it's like a glowy (laughs) gold or something it's just radiating off of you I think just being around people that are genuinely good people. That's why we live here in Fargo. I love the people of Fargo. You get to an intersection, four-way stop sign. It's everyone's like, no, you go. Oh, I know. No, you go. No, no, go ahead. You go. Please, you go. And now we're all just sitting here. Oh, oh, come on. I think that's what energizes me is being around good people that are genuinely happy and good to others and just passing that along and just the, it just feels like good karma. We beget what we give. Yeah. So it's very much if, if I'm always like giving that good vibe, I'm radiating this happiness and joy. I always subscribe to happiness is so circumstantial. It's fleeting. It comes and goes because mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. life, right? right? We have ups and downs, but joy, right. no one can take our joy away. That's so right. even on the bad days, if you're still able to kind of show and give off this glow of joy, people respond to it. Yes. It's not easy no. to choose joy, but when you do, you usually get it back. Yep, it's completely true. The key is also not to overthink things. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes we can just think ourselves down into a hole because we're thinking about, oh my gosh, but what if, what if, what if, what if? And then and it's like, then you're paralyzed. Mm-hmm. But if you kind of let go of that and just say, yeah, I can do this. I'm going to take the first step. I can do this. It's not going to be so bad. Kind of helps drive me through life too. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Would you have one thing that you do every day and it might not have to do with poop? I would say get a good night's sleep. I need my sleep. How do you get a good night's sleep? Well, I just, as soon as I put the kids down, if you're like, bye. Yeah. (laughs) If I could go to bed at eight o'clock every night, I would. But that's typically like my one hour where I like try to catch up on things and even just pick up around the house or, but you get that one hour, but then I'm in bed like Mm -hmm. nine, nine 30. And, or if on the weekend, if I'm not on call and then I put my kids down for their nap, I can't even imagine the day that they don't nap anymore. That time frame is the same 20 year olds that don't poop unicorns. Yeah. Like, <laughs> sadly, this is coming to an end. I know. For you at some point. I know. A supportive partner is so helpful oh, in that when you're it just exhausted and like, I need a nap. Absolutely. That is tremendous. I do. I have a very supportive partner. I That's mean, I, I can't be more thankful for that. He's my rock. He keeps me grounded. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Now, where did you guys meet? We met when I was in medical school. So I was in Maine. So you've been in Florida, you've been in Maine and now here in Fargo. So I love that when you speak about Fargo and the great people, it's yeah. because of experience. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And so, you know, it's true. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, it's true. so you guys met in Maine. How many years ago? Mm-hmm. We'll be married for 10 years. So we probably met like 13 years ago. So literally graduated, got married, <laughs> moved down to Tampa, Florida. And that's okay. where I did my residency. So I did residency for internal medicine for four years, Mm -hmm. and then you do another four years of GI. And then from Tampa, after my fellowship, then I came up here to Fargo. It'll be five years in July. Both of your kids have been born in Fargo. Yes. Isn't that just crazy? It is. You've planted your North Dakota roots. Yes, (laughs) it is. It really is. I'm so glad that you are here in Fargo and at Essentia. You're radiating something special. I'm really hoping that we're able to give something 
to a listener today that feels like, you know what? It's okay. I'm going to have the courage to make a phone call to my primary tomorrow and get the ball rolling. I hope so, too. Whether it's poop, whether it's acid reflux, whether it's any of that internal business going on. Right. That you have a hunch that is not right. And it's not just me, but it's the whole GI department. Mm -hmm. It's myself and the other physician is Dr. Regender. He's been with the center for like 25 years. And then we have three APPs, so advanced practice practitioners. So two NPs and one PA. And so they're always in clinic. great team. It's an awesome team. I'm in the procedural world world a lot. Mm -hmm. So when patients try to get in to see me in clinic, I'm only in clinic a half day a week. So it's not easy to see me in clinic. But I always say, get an appointment with any of my APPs. Mm -hmm. And then when you need a procedure, I'm here for you. So it's you kind of get two for one. Nurse practitioner PA plus you'll get a physician that's directing all of your care. And when you have like a really good team approach like that. We do. You know, you're still within the family. (laughs) Yes. And we always talk to each other constantly. Like we send messages back and forth about patients. And if I've seen someone before, we all work together as a team. Good communication. Absolutely. That's the key to a good team. yeah. The key to hopefully a good podcast is people just like you that are on this Dare to Ask podcast. Thank you so much. Yes, It absolutely. was such a treat to have you here. Super fun. Promise that you'll come back because I don't think poop has an end date. I no, think poop is life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but I had immediately felt like I want to be her bestie. Don't forget that um, you can do an easy Google search for the Bristol stool scale or stool charts. I printed one off because I wanted to know for sure what type 3 and type 4, which are both considered normal, or in Dr. Cole Course's uh, little phrase, poop goals. <laughs> I wanted to know what those looked like. Our next episode we're working on. Episode 3, she's something special. It obviously takes some kind of heart to be a pediatric cardiologist. This can be a huge, heavy subject for some. We're talking about kids with heart issues and survival. And so we're going to dig into that. And I'm really excited to be able to introduce you to Dr. Rouser Foltz on the next episode of Dare to Ask. The information contained in this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for personalized professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The information is general in nature. If you have questions or concerns, please contact your provider. Want to know the secret to a great night's sleep? I'm listening. It's the Gel Flex Grid, and only purple mattresses have it. It's made from a hyperelastic polymer that instantly responds to your body. The Gel Flex Grid is why purple mattresses are soft where you want it and firm where you need it. Wow, tell me more. It flexes around pressure points, keeping you supremely comfortable. Plus, the Gel Flex Grid has over 1,400 air channels that let hot air flow away from your body, so you sleep sweetly through the night. Learn more at purple.com. More at purple.com. More at purple.com.